Hello, I'm Death's Arrow, and welcome to episode 11 of What I'm Thinking. With the 7.5 patch recently going live, there have been several new additions as well as changes to World of Tanks. This episode will focus on one of the new additions, the Jagdpanzer E100. A quick note regarding this episode. Normally, I wouldn't create an episode on a tank that I haven't played at least 50 and generally closer to 100 games on. In the case of the Jagdpanzer E100, there's been viewer demand for replays on this tank destroyer. So in order to produce this episode sooner, the replays featured in this episode have been provided by two experts, Death187 and Jovial Madness. From a historical perspective, the Jagdpanzer E100 is one of the Entwicklung series concepts developed by Germany near the end of World War II. The Entwicklung series, more commonly known as the E series, was Germany's attempt late in World War II to produce a standardized series of tank designs. This was due to the highly complex tank designs that had resulted in poor mechanical reliability and low production rates. The E series designs were simpler, cheaper to produce, and more efficient than their predecessors. The Jagdpanzer E100 tank destroyer concept was planned to be built on the E100 chassis and mount a 170mm gun in a fixed casemate. It is one of several concepts developed for the E100 chassis. It isn't clear whether or not this concept would have proceeded to production. In World of Tanks, the Jagdpanzer E100 is king of the alpha damage tanks. Its 170mm gun is capable of knocking out almost any tank in the game in just two shots. The cost of having high alpha damage, though, is long reload times, and it takes approximately 22 seconds to reload the gun. As noted in the historical introduction, the Jagdpanzer E100 is based on the chassis of the E100 tank, which means that the hull has the same strengths and weaknesses as the E100. While the upper glacis is very strong, the lower glacis is a weak spot, and since the transmission is located at the front of the tank, penetrations to the lower plate can damage the engine and cause fires. So it is advisable to either hide the lower plate or try to angle the tank to bounce an rounds. Like most German tanks, the side and rear armor are weak, but like the E100, the side skirts do absorb HE splash damage from Artie. The casemate offers good protection, although there are a number of tanks in games now that can penetrate it. The Jagdpanzer E100 can be a difficult vehicle to play. It has a number of limitations including limited horizontal gun traverse, limited gun depression, poor mobility, and poor camo. The horizontal gun traverse is a double-edged sword, as it requires frequent hull rotations to track targets and forces you to square up your armor to get shots. Ideally, you want to angle your tank at your opponent to enhance your armor, and you can't do that when you're trying to shoot with this tank destroyer. While the gun depression isn't terrible at 6 degrees, it still requires exposing the lower plate to hit targets. The Jagdpanzer E100's mobility is similar to the E100, and while it's not terrible, it can be difficult to keep up with the main line of attack. I found on more than one occasion that I can't reach a battle in time to get into the fight. The poor mobility also makes it easy for Artie to hit you before you can get into cover. This also leads to the concern of getting flanked and pinned by faster opponents. Generally speaking, you want to avoid close quarters combat with this TD unless you have help. The Jagdpanzer E100 also has a very poor camo rating and generally gets spotted as soon as it fires. With the limitations of the Jagdpanzer E100, it's best to play it as a support tank, providing heavy firepower to the main line of attack. A conservative approach is required, especially on open maps. Cover from Artie is a must if you plan on surviving. Compared to the other new Tier 10 tank destroyers, the Jagdpanzer E100 is lacking. While it does have the highest alpha damage, its damage per minute is far below its peers. The same is true of its mobility, which is by far the worst. The T110E4 is currently best in class, and I doubt that will change much even with the announced nerfs to the E4 and buffs to the Jagdpanzer E100 coming in the next patch. For equipment on this tank, I recommend vents to improve all crew skills, a rammer to decrease reload times, and an enhanced gun laying drive to improve aim time. I don't recommend binoculars or a camo net because of this tank's limited horizontal gun traverse, which requires frequent repositioning. Also, it should be noted that the Jagdpanzer E100's camo rating is very poor, and a camo net will not enhance the camo rating very much. For crew skills, I've changed my philosophy recently. While repair is still a very useful skill for high-tier German tank destroyers, the Sixth Sense perk should be prioritized for the commander. It's one of the few crew perks or skills that adds something rather than just enhances something else, and what it adds is very valuable, not just knowing when you're spotted, but when you aren't spotted as well. As a tank destroyer, knowing that you aren't spotted is critical, and the difference between getting more shots on targets or getting arty to death. Since Sixth Sense is a perk, which requires it to be 100% before it works, I recommend training repair first for the commander, then doing a reskill once the first skill is at 100% or greater if you plan to do the credit or free reskill option. I still recommend repair for the rest of the crew. Other useful crew skills are clutch braking, off-road king, situational awareness, safe stowage, and adrenaline rush. The first replay that we'll be looking at is a solo battle from Death187 on South Coast from August 4th, 2012. 
The map for this battle is South Coast, which is meant to represent the Black Sea coast. The map is dominated by a town located on the western side of the map with a beach running along the entire western edge of the map. The rest of the map is divided into narrow routes surrounded by cliffs. Tactics for this map tend to vary, with mixed flank pushes depending on team composition and player skills. Snipers will generally gravitate to the overlooks at C6 and 7 as well as F6. Personally, I prefer the northern base on this map due to its superior sniping positions, but both sides are reasonably well balanced. As noted on the loading screen, this is a standard battle. Reviewing tank composition for this battle reveals the following. This is a tier 10 battle with two tier 10s per side. Both teams have six tier 9s. Death's team has six tier 8s, while the enemy's team has four tier 8s and a tier 7. Death's team also has a single tier 7 arty piece, while the enemy's team has a tier 6 and a tier 4. The enemy's team has a definitive mobility advantage, while Death's team has better firepower. I don't recognize anyone in this battle. As noted in the introduction, this replay was supplied to me by Death187, and this is a standard battle. Death has started from the northern base. This is a good side for a tank destroyer, as there's plenty of really nice sniping spots near base. Death is headed south here. This is very typical to what I do in a lot of battles on this map. There are a number of really good locations that have soft cover from spots and hard cover from artillery. Looks like Death will use this hill in front of him for hard cover from artillery. This is a good location. It gives you opportunities to shoot at the eastern flank, and then you can relocate if you need to support the town side. He's going to huddle right up against this hill which is a smart move. Looking at the mini-map, he has a medium scout headed into town. Okay, they've spotted a Lorraine. Death has been spotted based on his six cents. He gets a hit on the Lorraine, knocks him down to nine hit points. Second Lorraine is also in town. Head 59 is in trouble. The Aus B knocks down the Lorraine. Death is trying to get a shot at the other Lorraine, but it's behind buildings. I also have an IS-3 and an IS-4 on this flank. I have a really nice sniping line here on the cliff edge. T110E5, Os B, Death's Yag Panzer E. Death knocks down the other Lorraine. I have a Type 59, an IS-3, and a T-34 up on the edge of this little village here. There is a 50 Foch and an IS-3 now spotted. Death is lining up the 50 Foch. It's a big hit there. You can see that this gun is capable of doing 1,000 plus point damage every time out. And the OSB knocks down the 50 Foch. IS-4 spotted. Looking at the mini-map, most of the team is on this flank, although they do have a few tanks huddled at B1. There's some enemies spotted at E3. IS-3 is trying to back away from the IS-4. Death lines up a shot. Gets a hit there. A little bit of a low roll, although that's nothing to sneeze at. The IS-4 hits him in the track. No damage. Bounces a shot. IS-3 and E-50 are going to head up to the corner there. Looks like an artillery splash maybe on that os -B. Could have been a missed shot. Death is trying to line up that os -B, but he can't see very much of him. Misses. 
team has this flank well covered. Death doesn't really have a shot at the moment. He's now trying to line up the IS-3. Not really going to have a shot with all the buildings. IS-4 is peeking out again, but he still can't quite see him. IS-3 is going to support their IS-4. Death's got it already lined up. The enemy knows he's there, so they're being careful. Looking at the mini-map, the team that was guarding the beach has been beaten down a bit. Looks like they're down to just T-30. Death's trying to line up the off B. Looks like the beach side is lost. Death gets a hit on the IS-3. Takes a hit in return. A little bit of damage there. Even with the pressure of the other side being open at this point, Death is staying on his targets over here. Nice shot. Knocks down the IS-4. Boss B is burning down. They knock down the enemy's IS-3. Death is lining up the Aus B. He's 31 hit points. Kill if he shoots him. And he knocks him down. Death is now turning to go support the other flank. And we have a 1390 that just got knocked down, a T-62A, and a T-50. Friendly low is at one shotable status. He also has the T110 there and the Aus B. His team has a heavy tank at J0. That should take care of the enemy Artie. Death knocks down the E50. He is now going to move up as these enemies have defilated from him. Tiger 2 in town. T110E5 is charged up on the enemies on this flank. We've got a Patton and a T62A now. T110 is taking a beating. There's a T34 as well. Death goes after the Patton and knocks him down. He's now backing up to reload, angling his armor. T62A knocks down their T110E5. Death using the wreck to keep him out of the line of fire of the T-62A. Takes a turret shot and bounces, but the Aus B set the T-62A on fire. Artie knocks down the T-62A. Death is now moving up on this T-34. Also have an IS. Lines up the IS. Knocks him down. Even with the long reload times, the fact that this gun can do a thousand points of damage is pretty scary to most opponents. Especially a tier 7 opponent that would be hard pressed to pen his front armor. Death is moving up. Being aggressive here can afford to be. T-34 isn't particularly maneuverable. Hits the T-34. Tried to go for the ram there, but the Aus B took the kill. Tiger 2 spotted. It's a little hung up on the T-34 wreck. Team's in really good shape here, just the Tiger 2 remaining. And they've got the enemy base capped to 65%. Death wheels around, he gets a no damage pen, and then rams the Tiger 2 to death for the win.
Looking at the victory screen, Death destroyed 7 tanks, damaged 4 more, hit 13 of 14 shots, and earned 1,681 experience. He also earned Top Gun and a Bolter's Medal. Overall, Death187 played this match just about perfectly. He positioned himself in Artie Shadow in a location which allowed him to support the main bulk of his team. While the enemy tanks on the eastern flank had opportunities to shoot Death, they were forced to shoot at his front armor while he had flank shots the entire time. While the western flank folded fairly quickly, Death didn't turn to face the enemies on that flank until he had cleared the eastern flank. There was no reason to turn until those enemies could threaten him. Once he turned his attention to that flank, he methodically and effectively worked over the enemies. His use of the dead T-110E5 was particularly smart, as it gave him cover from the enemy's T-62A while he reloaded. Death finished off the match by ramming the Tiger II after his shell penetrated but did no damage. The developers claim that this is not a glitch, but it didn't make a lot of sense given that the Tiger II had the stock turret mounted. The second replay that we'll be looking at is a solo battle from Jovial Madness on Fishing Bay from August 6, 2012. The map for this battle is Fishing Bay. This map is a combination of open spaces and irregular terrain. The eastern side of the map is a town abutting a seaport with narrow streets. One street of the town cuts through the center of the map. The remainder of the map is open rolling terrain. Generally, heavy tanks gravitate towards the town side of the map as it provides cover from arty fire. Mediums will either rush middle and use the buildings as cover or will rush down to the ditch on the one line. While the northern base has some good sniping positions since at B1 and 2, the map is generally well balanced. As noted on the loading screen, this is a standard battle. Reviewing tank composition for this battle reveals the following. This is a tier 10 battle with 5 tier 10s per side. Jovial's team has an additional tier 9 while the enemy's team has a T50-2. Both teams have two equivalent arty pieces. The only player I recognize is 2 minutes hate from the forums, but I've never seen him in game before. As noted in the introduction, this replay was supplied by Jovial Madness, and this is a standard battle. Jovial has spawned at the southern base. On this particular map, because there isn't a lot of good arty cover, a TD like this normally would be in a lot of danger. As we get underway, Jovial is headed to the northeast. It appears that he will likely go to town. So give him good arty cover. With the poor camel rating of the Yagi 100, he will easily be spotted by any enemies that go to the middle of the map. If spotted a T-50-2. And a Patton 3, T-62A. If spotted a M-48, Patton 3. And an E-50. Two E-50s. Wheel continues to press to town, keeping an eye on the enemies in the middle. He does have six cents, so he'll know if he's spotted. He also spot a Lorraine. He has an M103 and an E75 in front of him. Object 268 spotted. Bumps into the E75. He's been spotted by the 268. He should have already cover though. IS-4 spotted further down the road. Looking at the minimap, there is a standoff in the center of town with the mediums. And Jovial's team has four heavies himself and looks like a medium at the back of town. Jovial's keeping a close eye on this Object 268. He has an obscured shot. He's not taking it. Luckily he didn't, because he lost B cut in front of him. He's now moving up to the corner of this building. Continuing to keep an eye on that Object 268 as the M103 pushes up. Nice use of this building here. He can actually hide about half of his hull. It gives him a spot to back up and reload. He's actually pushing up now. There's also an IS-4 over here. It was the same one that was on the main street. Jovial's eyeballing the IS-4 here.
IS-4 is playing it really smart, not pushing out too far. M-103 is making a move on him, though. Jovial's pushing up. Looks like he's going to try to support them. Looking at the mini-map, a scout has broken through and is now attacking the RD at K-7. Jovial continues to push up to support his M-103. And they have the IS-4 and Object 268 sandwiched between the M-103 and the E-75. Jovial lines up the object and shoots at the back. So now I'm going to turn on this IS-4. Bounces a shot. In some respects, face-hugging is advantageous with the Yagi. Jovial is still reloading. IS-4 gives him side turret and he knocks it down. They have a T-62A spot on the other side. There's also an M-48 Patton 3 in the middle. And an M-103 to Jovial's right. They've got good presence in town, but their team is taking a beating. They're down by one tank. The enemy definitely controls the middle of the map right now. Jovial's pushing up on this T-62A. He's got a line here. He lines up his shot. It's a nice hit there and lights the T-62A on fire. T-62A survives with 88 hit points. Jovial takes a hit to the front. Two minutes hate knocks down the T-62A. Jovial bounces another shot. He's trying to line up this patent 3. Also has an E50M overlooking. They also have an E75, but it's all the way on the other side of the center town. Jovial's having a hard time finding shots here. The enemy is playing it pretty smooth. Bounces a shot from the patent. And another shot. Takes his flank shot. He's in a crossfire here. Not a good spot to be. He thought he was able to use that building for flank protection, but looks like the Lorraine has maneuvered around and gotten some shots in his flank. Takes another hit for damage. Not a good spot to be in. You can see he's starting to back out and get away from the crossfire that he put himself into. Unfortunately, it opened himself up to the M103. He's at 28% now. His team is now down four tanks. Not a good situation. Patton 3 charges in, Jovial gets a hit but tracks him. It's one of the things that stinks about having a high-powered gun like that with a long reload. If you track someone, it's very frustrating. Jovial took another hit there. He's down to 11% here. team is still down three tanks. They've lost all their arty. It's Jovial, a M46 Patton, and a T-54. Patton takes out the E-50M. Jovial's got the Lorraine and the M103 in front of him. T-54 knocks down the Lorraine. Jovial's now maneuvering around to try to get the M103. Uh, I just saw on the mini-map that there was a heavy at H4. It would be the E-75. Jovial lines up the M-103 and knocks him down with the blind shot. Backs himself into cover here to try to avoid getting hit by Artie. Gets hit. He's down to 4%. He lost his track. He uses his repair kit to repair the tracks. One of the things that's nice about the 7.5 patch is that repair kits repair both tracks instead of just one. The enemy is now capping the base. With both mediums pressing in to try to get artillery, Jovial knows he needs to turn around and head back to base. The only problem is the AG E100 is slow, and with about a minute and 20 seconds till the base is capped, Jovial might not make it. One of the mediums is knocked down attacking Artie. 
but the T-54 finishes off the Lorraine already. They still have an M4043 and an E-75 against Jovial's Yagi 100 and the T-54. Jovial is going as fast as the Yagi 100 will go to try to get back to base. Continues pushing on to base. T-54 isn't far behind him. He is about 100 to 200 meters ahead. This is really tight here. Jovial spots the E-75. E-75 knocks down the T-54. And Jovial knocks down the E-75 with just a second to spare on the cap. Just excellent timing there. Jovial's kind of shuffling back and forth here to try to avoid getting hit by Artie, assuming Artie's paying attention, which it should be. He's now trying to decide what to do. It's himself versus an M4043. The advantage is his, for the most part. He has better view range, although the gun situation is kind of mitigated by the fact that he's one-shottable. Jovial has decided to press up the middle. This is a smart play. There's about five minutes remaining in this match. If Artie's going to camp it out, it gives Jovial the opportunity to move up and get to their cap. If the enemy Artie makes the decision to try to cap, Jovial will be in position to turn around and shoot him from a higher elevation, which should give him a spotting advantage. Slow going for the Yagi 100 here. Jovial's just reached the center town. And the Artie is spotted at K4. Jovial wheels around. The Artie cannot spot him, and even if he could, he'd be unlikely to get an accurate shot off. The Artie disappears, but he is capping the base, as expected. Jovial spots the M4043. Takes his time, lines him up, takes a shot, knocks him down for the win. Looking at the victory screen, Jovial destroyed four tanks, damaged three more, hit seven of eight shots, and earned 1,348 experience before the double. He also earned Steel Wall and Defender for his 100 points of cap reduction. Overall, Jovial's decision to go to town was the right move given that the map had little arty cover. He had good support in town, which allowed him to be aggressive. Jovial got into a bit of trouble in the middle of the match when he put himself into a crossfire. He kept his calm and was able to escape that situation without getting knocked out. Once the enemy started capping, Jovial knew that he had to go back to base or the match would have definitely been a loss, and he got back just in the nick of time to knock down that E-75 and save the day. He then moved up the middle of the map to give himself the best options given the one-on-one -on -one situation, and it paid off with him knocking out the last enemy and winning the match. Thank you for watching this episode of What I'm Thinking. Stay tuned for another episode soon. In the next episode, I'll be focusing on the Soviet T-43 and how this medium tank has changed between the 7.4 and 7.5 patch. Before signing off, I want to thank Death187 and Jovial Madness for allowing me to use their replays, as this episode wouldn't be possible at this time without their help. Ha, ha, ha.